Hey guys, how's it going? I hope um, you are enjoying uh, your extra time as you get your schoolwork done. Um, I know I certainly certainly have been enjoying my family and the extra time. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about the circulatory system, more specifically the heart and the tissues that um, move blood around the body. This is probably my favorite subject. This became like my favorite subject when I was in college. I've added a couple of subjects over the years um, that have intrigued me that I've become more interested in. Uh, but this one was my first love, if you want to say, when it came to science, um, specifically anatomy and physiology. So starting the circulatory system, our unit uh, asked the question, how does the circulatory system repair the body and supply it with oxygen and nutrients? Think of the circulatory system as the transport system. It's the only way in which all the nutrients and all the oxygen and all the hormones and all the things that need to be moved around the body move. They gotta get into the circulatory system at some point and be dropped off um, or picked up at some point as well. So let's go ahead and get started with the structure first. Um, maybe, there it is. Structure of the circulatory system. So first we talk about the blood, okay? That's the main thing. There are two, um, components of blood. If you were to collect blood in a uh, test tube or the little blood collection tubes that you see when you um, give blood for blood work, okay, um, those tubes we put into a centrifuge, which is like this big machine that spins it really, really fast so that um, it actually separates the plasma from what we call the formed elements, okay. Um, in our uh, textbook, they don't call it formed elements. The formed elements are erythrocytes, leukocytes and platelets. And they're gonna be a little heavier, so they're gonna to drop to the bottom. If you'll see that little tube on your um, screen or on this picture here, uh, the platelets and the leukocytes and the erythrocytes, they're all gonna be heavier, so they're gonna drop down to the bottom and the plasma is gonna to come to the top. And that happens when you spin them really, really, really fast. It won't just happen on its own. Um, you have to put them in a special machine in order for that to occur. And so plasma is mainly water. It's about 90% water, okay, um, with uh, a few other components um, as well. But when we look at it in blood as a whole, plasma makes up 55% of your blood, okay? And that's like the fluid that the tissue, erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets are flowing through, okay, or flowing with, if you want to say. Think of um, them as erythrocytes, leukocytes, like boats flowing through the river. The river is the plasma. Okay, um, when we look at the formed elements, the erythrocytes make up 45%. So pretty much the entire formed elements are erythrocytes. If you don't know, put next to this red blood cells, or you can abbreviate it RBC, red blood cells. Leukocytes are just a small percentage, okay? If you don't know what a leukocyte is, you can put right next to it WBC. This is a white blood cell. Platelets, we're gonna talk about in a little bit and I'll give you some other names for it as well, okay? On, in your textbook on page 436 is a picture of the heart and I'm actually gonna scroll on down to it. And let's go ahead and look at the heart for just a few seconds um, and look at the way it is structured. So on this picture, okay, and most pictures dealing with the circulatory system or the heart, the blue colored vessels are gonna typically be um, veins because they're carrying deoxygenated blood, which typically takes on like a very dull, red, almost a dark maroon color um, as it's flowing through the body. Um, and you'll see that all the arteries become red, okay, um, because they are carrying oxygenated blood. There is an exception to this, but I'm not going to get into that um, right now. You'll see it here in a little bit. Okay, so number eight and number seven, these are superior and inferior vena cava, um, and they are directly going into number three, which is your right atrium okay um, from the right atrium uh, we go through those little white looks like little jellyfish looking things those are actually the tricuspid valve okay flows to the tricuspid valve into number five which is your right ventricle okay ventricles are going to be at the base of the heart atriums are going to be at the top of the heart okay uh, so just to help you remember so on the right side so when we're looking at this heart um, it's actually the right side okay uh, because we're looking at this person or this heart as if that person was looking directly back at you. So it's flipped, okay? So three and five are the right atrium, right ventricles, uh, respectfully. And then if you look at um, number four and number six, you are seeing um, the left atrium and left ventricle. Um, 
trying to think. Okay, on the left hand side, uh, we have the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve. Um, we're not learning that for this case, but I do want to introduce it to you. It actually has two names um, and it's called the mitral valve most commonly. Sometimes you'll hear the word bicuspid valve referred to it. So let's look at the top here, the, the number 11, the red little round vessel there, it has three other vessels branching out. That is the aorta, that's the largest um, artery in the body, leaving the heart, taking blood to the rest of the body. Number two is a septum. Um, there's actually more defined names of it, but for this course, we're just gonna call it the septum, and that's because it separates, okay, the right and left sides of the heart called the septum. Number one, referring here to the wall of the, um, of the heart, this thicker portion is actually the muscle that they're asking for here, and it's called the myocardium. Myocardium, it's the heart or the muscle portions of the heart. Um, we talked um, earlier, I think in a review, it's being the um, strongest muscle in the heart, okay, hardest working one. Um, Let's look at the vessels branching off. So uh, 10 and nine up here on the, uh, on the top right side of your um, picture here. Uh, so we'll see that number 10 is blue. That is deoxygenated blood. But in this situation, it is an artery, okay? Because it's going away from the heart. Arteries always move away from the heart. And it's actually headed to the lungs. It's gonna pick up oxygen and it's gonna come back on a pulmonary vein. That's number nine. Um, and it's oxygenated. That's why it's red at that time entering the left atrium, then from the left atrium down the um, bicuspid valve or mitral valve into the left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts, it goes out number 11, the aorta, okay? Uh, we'll revisit that here in just a second, but just to kind of give you a heads up as we move there. So blood vessels, arteries, veins, and capillaries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Circle that word away and connect arteries, which starts with an A, with away from the heart. Okay, that's how I remember arteries go away. And then veins carry blood to the heart. Um, one interesting component or characteristic of veins is that they have valves, okay? So on the arterial side or on the artery side of our hearts, okay, if you wanna say, there's a lot of pressure, okay, created by the contraction of our heart muscle. And as we move through the arteries, through the capillaries and back into the veins, the pressure it has diminished. And so valves basically keep blood flowing in the right direction, okay? Making sure that it's going back to the heart because if they didn't, then the blood would start to pull. And a lot of times that's how uh, we end up with varicose veins, okay? Um, because sometimes those valves give out. Um, capillaries, capillaries connect arteries and veins. It's the movement of nutrients occurs here. So uh, think of it this way. You have the heart up here, uh, forcing blood out. Arteries carry things to a tissue. They get smaller and smaller until they get to these really, really small vessels called capillaries. At that point, at the capillary location, that's where oxygen and carbon dioxide can exchange places. That's where nutrients can move out of the circulatory system into the tissues. Movement of nutrients, can only occur in a capillary. They cannot occur in an artery or a vein. It has to only occur at a capillary. Once that occurs, the blood continues to move into uh, veins and eventually back to the heart. Let's look here at the function. Of course, exploring blood plasma, mostly water. Uh, if you want to put it, it's about 90% water. Affected by what we eat and drink, carries nutrients and hormones. That's why it's really um, beneficial when we do a blood draw because we're getting some of that information as well. Uh, erythrocytes, okay? These are your red blood cells. They carry oxygen and hemoglobin, okay? Um, I'm sorry, oxygen on hemoglobin, okay? Some of you guys did this in one of the reviews. Um, when I asked you which gases are carried by erythrocytes and you said carbon dioxide and oxyhemoglobin. So I wanna clarify here. Hemoglobin is a protein that is capable of carrying oxygen and carbon dioxide. When it's carrying a lot of oxygen, we call it oxyhemoglobin, okay? And when it's not, we call it deoxyhemoglobin, okay? Uh, so the gases that I'm actually looking for um, are um, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Leukocytes, these are your white blood cells, okay? Um, obviously, they're gonna increase during infection. So if you're sick, not feeling well, the um, number of white blood cells are going to increase. Another reason why blood work or having blood uh, tests done can help us kind of figure out what's wrong with you is because a lot of times knowing which white blood cells are increased in your um, blood can usually lead us in the right direction of what might be the problem. 
and then platelets, okay? Also called thrombocytes. If you wanna circle that word thrombocytes, we now have two words for all of the formed elements in blood. These are cell fragments. They don't have the um, true nature of a cell. As far as the cell wall and all of those components, these are just cell fragments, okay? And they, um, their main job is coagulation, okay? This is a really big word for blood clotting. Okay, so if you have a cut, let's say uh, you're uh, walking through the woods and you get scraped with a, um, a bush or something, it starts to bleed, it's, there's a process that occurs that causes the blood to clot together so that you don't bleed out, okay? And that's done by platelets along with a couple of other chemicals. Um, red blood cells will play a small uh, component in that. And I've given a picture here um, on the bottom right-hand side of your screen you'll see like that netting uh, that's occurring, okay? Uh, that's those platelets causing that net-like component to occur and all those um, red blood cells are getting stuck in it, which eventually is gonna help you create um, your clot. So I've included this, this is really cool if you're kind of nerdy like me. Uh, so what we've done here is this is a microscope slide or a, a slide of um, a blood sample. So a drop of blood or a drop or two of blood we've put on here um, and we're looking at them. And so uh, those bottom left one, I wanna focus on first, the right, red blood cells are pretty um, easy. They're usually dark around the edges and a little bit lighter in the center. Um, think about that bioconcave shape of red blood cells. And then white blood cells, they're always a little larger than all the other cells, okay? The coloring that you see is created uh, by the stain that's being used to produce this slide, okay? Um, so their white blood cells aren't actually purple, okay? Um, but uh, they've used a stain to help them kind of stand out and kind of help us identify the types of leukocytes, which we're not gonna be doing here. But I wanted you to realize, at least compare size-wise, red blood cells are gonna be smaller than our white blood cells. And our platelets, because they're just cell fragments, they're like little pin dots, if you want to say, um, in this slide. Okay, um, I want you to look at the slide to the bottom right, okay? Um, kind of think about the red blood cells that you see, some platelets and some, I, I see one white blood cell, at least that's all I recognize here. Um, but um, I want you to look around and look at the red blood cells and tell me if you, or think about uh, what is different about them and what you think might be the problem. I'll give you a few minutes to kind of think about it. Okay, they look kind of crescent shaped. Some of them do, especially the one uh, right there in the center. They don't have that really pretty round shape that we would typically think of a red blood cell. This is a slide of someone with sickle cell disease. And what happens in sickle cell, um, it's a genetic mutation that causes some of the proteins in our red blood cells to um, not be created correctly. And so the protein is misshaped. And as a result, the cell kind of folds over on top of itself. And that's why you have those uh, kind of sickle shaped or crescent shaped uh, red blood cells, that's sickle cell disease. Let's go down to the heart. So here are different aspects of the heart. The myocardium is the muscle layer. The septum is what separates the right and left sides. The atria, okay, or uh, the atrium, um, receive blood into the heart, that's at the top, okay? And then the ventricles pump blood out of the heart, either on the right side to the lungs or the left side to the body. But the ventricles, remember, they sit at the bottom of the heart. Inferior and superior vena cava, these are the main veins that bring blood in. Pulmonary veins carry blood from the lungs to uh, the heart. Um, pulmonary arteries carry blood from the heart to the lungs. Okay, the aorta is, of course, the main artery leaving the heart. We just talked about some of those, and that brings us back to our structure here, which you can also find in your online textbook. I think it's page 432. Let's go down to, so blood flow through the heart. This is the order from when it enters the heart to it exits the heart. So superior and inferior vena cava, directly into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle. Right ventricle contracts, forcing blood into the pulmonary arteries, carries it to the lungs to pick up oxygen, comes back through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium through the bicuspid or mitral valve. Left ventricle, left ventricle contracts, forcing blood out of the aorta to the rest of the body, and then that process just continues. So valves, valves are found in um, not only veins, but we've just seen them also in the heart as well. Once again, it controls blood flow through the heart or through the circulatory system. These are one-way doors, okay? They only open in one direction and blood can only flow 
in one direction. If it doesn't work, blood is not going to flow in the proper direction, and then you're gonna have problems, depending if you're talking about veins or heart. Um, cardiac cycle, so this is kind of a, um, a cool component. We talk a little bit about blood pressure here as well. So when the heart contracts, this is called systole. And when the heart relaxes, we call that the filling phase where it's filling with blood into the ventricles, we call this diastole. If you get your blood pressure taken at the doctor's office or whatever, they're gonna give you a number, okay? Or a fraction, really. Number on top, number on bottom, okay? The top number is typically higher. That's your systolic blood pressure. Diastolic is your uh, resting pressure, and that's usually on the bottom. And so what they're saying is they're actually measuring the pressure in the blood vessels when the heart contracts and when the heart's relaxed, okay? And that's why that bottom number typically, um, it should be, is lower, okay? Um, there's lots of different reasons why the blood pressure would change and what the numbers differ, but the goal is the systolic number is always on top and the diastolic number is always on the bottom. And it's related to this idea of the heart contracting and the heart relaxing. That's how the, uh, why we take the two numbers. Okay. Circulatory system in the human body. All body systems need blood, why? Because we all need oxygen and we all need nutrients um, for all of the tissues in our bodies to survive. You have two circuits, okay? You have a pulmonary circuit, which is um, pulmonary, comes from the heart to the lungs, back to the heart. So think um, pulmonary arteries, go to the lungs, pick up oxygen, pulmonary veins, okay? That's your pulmonary circuit. Your systemic circuit is from the body to the heart, from the heart to the body. Even though they're kind of interconnected, okay, they work in, in tandem, if you wanna say, um, they're two different circuits, okay? Pulmonary, heart, lungs, heart, systemic, body, heart, body, okay? Blood transports oxygen and carbon dioxide, which is a byproduct of cellular respiration and is picked up um, in the air that we breathe and we don't need it, so we just send it right back out. Um, nutrients from the foods we eat. So we break down those carbs from our toast, uh, the protein uh, from our eggs that morning, um, and then maybe, um, this one, oh, fats from the butter on our toast, okay? And we break all those down into their basic components and we send them out to the body and the tissues pick up what they need uh, to do their job. And of course, waste products. As the cells are working, they're producing waste or byproducts of the processes that they're doing. They don't need it. They send it through the circulatory system. Um, and in some situations, like carbon dioxide, it gets breathed back out. Um, a lot of times um, it goes to the kidneys and the kidneys filter out the waste and it comes out um, through our urine. That brings us to the end of 22B, the circulatory system. If you have any questions, just email me um, and let me know.